address these expectations. Talked about a lot of this too. Pull fees, um, don't rely on one rescue. You guys should have lots and lots of partners. The more partners, the better. Um, have shelters that you partner with. Have rescues that you partner with. The all breed rescues are a phenomenal resource. They aren't getting the calls all day or as often as the groups that take in any, anything. So partner with Golden Retriever Rescue. I'm gonna use that as an example because we see so many Goldens in shelters. Um, but every time you get one that you consider purebred, call them. It may be completely adaptable through your shelter, but why take up a space if this rescue is okay to take it? That's what they do, that's what they specialize in. They've got space for it. So save that one for the, the mutt that you know is gonna be a little bit harder to tra transfer to rescue or a little harder to adopt out. Um, there are breed specific rescues for just, just about everything. Um, some of them kind of cover a region, Midwest, that's okay too. Talk to them. Ask them, is it okay if we keep you on a list? And when we get your breed into our shelter, I'm going to give you a call to see if you have space. Is that okay? If it is okay, what do you need from us? What is it you're expecting for this dog to have before it gets to you? What questions do you have now? Um, get those lists going and start you know, forming those partnerships. We have now with all breed rescues, we have specifically a golden retriever rescue that watches our website. Um, mm -hmm. Or if I'm not there a day and I don't call them, they're watching and they're calling and saying, hey, what's going on with so-and-so dog? Um, can I come get him? I mean, we have it with Springer Spaniel. A lot of the pure breed uh, rescues there, they're watching us to see what they have. And we're more than happy to work with them because, that, again, that does open a spot up for the lab mix or the, the shepherd mix, which we see so many of them. <laughs> So, and, but know who you're working with. Have them already pre-screened, already agreed to, and then when that dog comes in, you have to waste a bunch of time with, well, I heard there's an all breed, or I mean, I heard there's a breed specific, but we've got to talk to them and find out you know, how they work, are they reputable, or you know, are they one of those, actually a hoarder, but calling myself a rescue, or um, other unfavorable things. So, there are times you have to end a relationship. Mm -hmm. It's repeatedly just gone bad, I'm not getting what I want. We partnered with a shelter before that would send us um, photos. Here's all the dogs we need to rescue. And I'd say, okay, I've got, I can, I can fit that one, that one, that one, those match available space I have right now. The dogs come back. It's not even the same dog that they sent me the photo of. Um, and, and I called them on it, and they said, well, it's, it's close. <laughs> okay, but you didn't tell me that. If you had said to me, I'm sending you this chocolate lab, but I can't get a picture of him because he won't hold still, but I'm going to send you a picture of what he looks like. He looks exactly like this dog minus the white spot on the shoulder. Just tell me that, and then I understand, and then I don't feel like, well, why'd they lie to me? There's got to be something else that's going on. Um, mistakes happen, and that's okay. It's, you're looking for a pattern of deception or a pattern of red flags. Um, managing expectations is a good one, too. When problems arise, discuss it. Communication, you can never go wrong. Yeah. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. These are a dog. Um, this is Keebler. We pulled him from Toledo. And if you were paying attention to the video, you'll see that a lot of those dogs were pit bulls. Ohio has a lot of breed specific legislation. Um, we happen to have a lot of volunteers who love the breed, know the breed. Um, so we're just able to, by happenstance, take in a lot of um, pitties and pity mixes. But it's not all we get. This is Keebler. Keebler was really, really sick when, and I can't even remember how he came into Toledo. I think it was a cruelty case, actually. Yeah, I mean, he was just congested. He was matted. He hadn't been groomed. And he was cranky. He was so sick and so sore and so not feeling well. He wanted to be touched, he wanted to be near him. Um, it wasn't a dog to me that was going to be able to place up for adoption. So they called us. We went down and did kind of our own meet Keebler. Is this something that we can handle? Um, we decided, yes, we're going to give Keebler a chance. And I'm so, so, so glad we did because this was our Christmas card this past December. Um, <laughs> Keebler had now been in their home for over a year and didn't have a single negative thing to say. So this was a dog that in most open admission shelters wouldn't have been given a chance. He just had too much stuff going on. It was a long road up to recovery. He ended up, with, he had pneumonia, it was deep in his lungs, he had skin infection, he was so mad at he didn't want to be touched, he didn't like going into a crate. So he was a challenge, but we were able to get him where he needed to be and um, find him a home. Sky and Sunshine also came from Toledo. These puppies had parvo. And, um, I'm still very disappointed to see parvo categorized as something that's untreatable because it's not. We've never lost a parvo dog. It is. It can be expensive, um, if you, but if you catch it early enough, you, you know what you're looking at, and you've got a really good vet, 
there's no reason why cardboard need, dogs need to be put down. Unless, you know, if they've reached just a, a later stage, they're suffering, you can't keep food in them, if they're just constantly throwing up, you can't keep medicine in them. You've given them a fair amount of time to, to fight it, that's a little bit different. But to not even give them a shot, to not even try with medication. Um, this is Sky and Sunshine now. Um, they obviously couldn't be more comfortable, and their family is, is so, so happy. So another example of, thank God we have the partnership that we did, otherwise these two kids might not be here now. Um, this is Madeline, and she's actually not a dog that we pulled from Toledo, but it's an example of rescues working with rescues. Um, we picked Madeline up off the streets of Detroit. She was a mess. She had the green gunk in her eyes. Her breathing was just completely wrong, beyond the congestion. Um, she was very slow, and when you pick up strays off Detroit in the behavior temperament realm, you never know what you're gonna get. Um, but a person who lived down there had already gotten her into his backyard and into a kennel and was desperately calling for help. We knew that she was probably beyond our resources. But I called Sharpay Savers and said, listen, here's the deal. I'm going to send you some pictures. I'm going to tell you absolutely everything we know about her. We are going to take her to our vet. We are going to have her completely checked out to the best that we can so that I can tell you what we've got going on here. Are, are you even interested? Will you even consider this? And she said, yeah, let me know what you find out. So we took her to the vet. They diagnosed her with a detached sinuses. So it was like they were moving. Every time she moved, it would lock off her airway. And so it was very uncomfortable. This was not a surgery our vet was going to be able to do. Um, Sharpay's also, like a lot of breeds, have some very specific medical problems specific to them. And again, we're not sure, we don't know them. It's beyond me, my vet might, but it's beyond us and our kind of general knowledge. So um, we were able to get her to the vet and get her down to Sharpay Savers in Ohio. And um, she's doing great. She had surgery she needed through a vet that specializes in Sharpay's and knows their medical issues. Um, she had her eyes fixed. We sent her down with three weeks worth of antibiotics for the upper respiratory. Um, we agreed to pay for her spay once she was healthy enough to be spayed as a, again, mutually beneficial. You guys are helping me save this dog's life. Um, in return, I'm gonna do whatever I can to help you. I'm gonna pay for her spay, I'm gonna send her with whatever medication that we can get for her now. Um, and it worked out great. So um, just another example of how those partnerships can, can really work out and, and help. Um, she'd still be down in Detroit right now if we hadn't been able to do this. So that is, oh, actually, no, I have one more. Um, this is a current project. This is a house down near um, Pennyford Hospital off the Grand. They're demolishing the entire block of buildings. They are full of cats and probably a good handful of dogs as well. Um, they, this is beyond our resources. We can't pull every cat out of here. We have pulled five so far. Um, but this is a case where we need other rescues to help us, to go in and trap and take care of them on your own. Whether they're um, too feral and they need to go out to a barn, they, this is one place that can't be returned, at least not until everything's demolished, otherwise we're right back to where we were before. Um, so we're looking for barns for the seriously unsocialized ones. The thing that you have to know when you get into a case like this is you're going to have a lot of medical stuff. Um, of the cats we've pulled out of there, we've got um, Bartonella, we've got Ringworm, um, Nobody spayed and neutered, obviously. Um, however, they are all socialized, to a degree. They are not feral. These were obviously, at one point, somebody's cats, and when they left and moved out, they left them behind, and they kind of joined the colony. Um, we're able to pet them and touch them and medicate them. Thank God, because there's no other way to get rid of Rayhorb if you can't touch the cat. Um, so this is another example of where what we were contacted by the Ford Hospital to help them clear out these buildings because they don't want to tear them down with animals still inside. <coughs> we put out a call for help. House of Critters responded. They went down, set traps, picked up two. Um, little bits like that. No one rescue can go in and trap all 50 of these cats and actually treat them, take care of them, and get them where they need to be. Now, somebody can go in, trap them all, and put them all down, but that's not what we do. We're here to try and give them a chance and do the best that we can. So. Another example of um, chipping away at it with the help of other rescues and partnering. If we didn't know anybody, I didn't even have anybody I could call or email, I don't know what to do other than to keep trying to chip away at it ourselves. And again, there's, there's no way our rescue alone could handle. And that's just one house. This is an entire city block. Um, and it's all over Detroit. And they really are making a big push to tear down um, buildings right now. And they aren't equipped to clear them out either. So if you know of a, an area that's about to start, contact somebody and say, have you worked with any rescues or shelters or anybody to clear these animals out? There's no abandoned buildings that don't have animals in the Detroit. It just, it, 
I don't think it exists anyway. Um, there are 50,000 to 100,000 homeless dogs on the streets of Detroit. Um, cats, I, I couldn't even begin to put a number to it. So, um, so working together, we'll get there. Um, I'm going to give it to Jody to talk about foster care and building a foster care program, and I'll do the same and type in. And um, well, pretty much, without fosters, you can't survive. I mean, there's absolutely no way if we didn't have our foster program, our euthanasia rate would skyrocket. There's absolutely no way to exist without foster homes. Um, and we're always trying to get more foster homes. Uh, one of the biggest ways is obviously reach out to your community. Um, they're, you're there because of them. They're your supporters. They're your donators. Um, we have a media show every Saturday that uh, our director goes on. And he's every single Saturday, the Humane Society is looking for fosters. Contact Jody, um, give him my email address every single uh, a week. Uh, we hold orientations every other month, um, training, um, recruiting new fosters, uh, things like that, just getting new faces in. Um, we have very, very good regular fosters, but you always need more. I mean, one litter goes out to foster, a litter of kittens, especially now with it becoming kitten season. Uh, and five more litters come in. So your regular fosters are full. Start getting the temporary fosters. Start getting more faces into your program. Um, do that by reaching out. Um, we go, we put flyers anywhere we can think of. Um, we have them at an urban active gym. Um, you never know, people working out can still take care of pets. Uh, we have them um, at the grocery stores, anywhere that people are going to be, we have our flyers there. Um, Senior centers are a great one. Yeah. Um, they're happy to have something to do with their time in a lot of cases. And with, like you said, kitten season coming up, teachers, they're going to be out of school for the summer. They're sometimes looking for something to do or they just got the extra time to do it right then. So um, start contacting schools. Ask if you can put something in their teacher newsletter or just a flyer in their staff lounge. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, our schools are one of the biggest ways we get fosters. Um, we have an education depart department. That's their job is to go to schools and promote the Humane Society and educate the kids. Um, but we always slip foster brochures in anything that we go and talk to. It never, ever hurts. Um, we, with the orientations, I have one foster who's awesome. Um, I usually don't like talking in front of people. Um, <laughs> So I have a foster who does it for me. He has the slide, he, and he absolutely loves doing it. Every single time I have a foster orientation, he comes in and he trains everybody. He does it for me. That way I can be out taking, vaccinating the kittens, uh, getting them ready for foster homes so that they're done with training. They're leaving with a litter of kittens most of the time, litter of puppies, depending on uh, what you have there. Um, we have a peer assistance where we have educated and experienced fosters. Um, they're more than happy to give their phone numbers out to uh, new fosters. Um, and we just, it's a peer program. Um, if they have questions about how to take care of them, this kitten's hiding, what do I do? Uh, we have people on call for that. Uh, same with puppies. This puppy growled at me, something happened. We have somebody on call that will answer those questions for you so that I'm not on the phone 24 seven. Um, there's a volunteer doing that. Uh, we have an on call cell phone as well. Um, one of our vet techs holds that. Um, we're at the shelter. I'm usually there till eight o'clock at night, but um, we answer the phones until six. Um, stuff happens at night though. Mm -hmm. uh, we have an on call phone that every single foster um, has the number to. If there's an emergency, somebody's always there to pick the phone up. Um, I think one of the most frustrating things for fosters and volunteers is not getting help when it's needed. Um, so having somebody that's always guaranteed to answer that phone is really going to help people continue to foster and get your foster numbers up. If they're happy with you, they're going to tell their friends to foster, but if they're mad, they're going to tell their friends too, and we don't want that. We want as many people as we can. Um, our, uh, our animals too, we have two vets on staff. Um, so our animals come into the shelter every couple weeks for myself or for the animal care staff to just take a look at, make sure everything's okay. Um, do they need medicine? Um, with our kittens, I don't know why, but it's upper respiratory infections are huge. Um, we, 
just get so many of them, and um, even when they're in healthy homes, they get sick. Uh, we teach the fosters how to do that. We give them everything. Our fosters don't have to pay for one thing. Uh, we provide food, we provide cages, food bowls, blankets, anything you can think of. They don't have to spend any money on that. Um, obviously, they're more than welcome to. We have a couple, a couple of fosters that pay for everything, which helps us out tons. Um, but that's one of the perks, too, is it's not costing them one little bit, except time. Um, communication, though, that's one of the biggest things, though, I would say, with run, getting a foster care program up. Um, every single foster knows my email. They email me all the time, and I answer every single one of their emails. It may take a while, a day or two. I don't let it go any more past three days. If, I, if they're not hearing from me, then they're getting a call from me. Um, but it goes again to if they're not happy because they're not getting their questions answered, they're not going to foster with you again. Um, before I got into this position, we had so many people coming back with their kittens because they weren't happy about something. So we had kittens that were already in foster plus waiting for foster. It just got way too much. Uh, so definitely make sure you're you're answering their questions, you're attentive to, to them. They're there because they want to help. Um, I would say... I mean, your fosters are also the, one of the best resources for going onto your website on Pet Finder, reading their animal bio, and sending you changes to it. They know the details. I mean, you're going to hear throughout all day that the best photos and the most descriptive bios are what help your animals get adopted faster. Who knows them better than the fosters? And it's not just they're affectionate and friendly and they like to ride in the car and go for a walk. Well, most all of them do. Tell me what makes that dog unique. The fact that every morning she waddles downstairs and has to sit on the couch for five minutes before she can go outside. Or the way she makes her bed before she spins around ten times and lays down. Ask your fosters for that and ask them for better photos. The more photos, the better. Even though Pet Finder can only hold three, for free, you can use Google, put all the photos on there and create a photo album and then embed that onto their, their um, profile on Pet Finder. And that way, when they click that, they see a hundred photos and do, they've been doing all kinds of stuff instead of just those three pictures. Um, so use your fosters for that kind of stuff. They know their animal the best. Facebook is awesome too for a foster program. Uh, I put a picture of a litter of puppies that need foster and two hours later they're in a home with somebody and then they have about 50 pictures just in the next two days of the puppies at their house. Um, that's a huge, huge way to promote the foster program and um, show what the animals are like in a home situation, not in a kennel, in a, um, in a shelter somewhere. Um, one thing you do want to make sure when you are uh, creating a foster program is, I learned this the hard way, make sure you have guidelines and you stick to those guidelines for, um, for your fosters. Uh, we have a vet on staff, so we're lucky with that. Um, anytime someone has a medical problem, they're coming to us. If they're not, then they're calling the emergency cell phone number and getting permission to go to our, we have a contract with an emergency vet um, in our area. Uh, we've had fosters that don't listen to us and then we get a four or $500 bill for a kitten because it had an upper respiratory infection and it would have cost us $20 at the shelter. Um, so make sure your fosters know those guidelines and you're following those guidelines and they're following those guidelines. Because um, it's happened more than once and it gets really mm -hmm. expensive. Um, Do you have um, an application that they fill out? Did you already say that? Or? I did. did I, I uh, ran to work today and they're sitting at my desk. So okay. I'll upload it. So they do have an application? Yes, that absolutely. They have mm -hmm. applicant. They're... Um, go through the same adoption process. Um, their animals have to be spayed and neutered. Obviously, we don't want them creating more animals while they're in foster. Um, they have to be up to date on vaccines. We actually um, require that they um, separate their personal animals from ours for at least two weeks. Um, just because ours are coming off the streets, we have no idea what they could be exposed to. Um, so we want to make sure if the hand loop, cargo, anything like that, if these animals do have those, they're not infl or infecting their own pets. And we can't treat their own pets. Uh, so we make that very clear to fosters before taking an animal home. Um, we use the same application for our adopters that we do for fosters, and for the same reason. 
Um, a lot of your fosters are going to want to adopt. Fosters make flunkies or whatever their you know, your term of endearment is for that. It's great. Um, but that's a problem. If you're letting somebody foster who you wouldn't adopt to, and then they suddenly go, and I want to keep Sparky. You go, oh boy. Um, I can't let you because your other dog's not neutered or lives outside when you're not home or has some other thing going on that is not okay within your policies and stuff. So we put our fosters through the same application as if they're adopting. Yeah. We had a problem um, a couple years ago before uh, we really started to screen fosters. Um, some, we had an injured pit bull come in, had a broken leg, needed fostered for eight weeks while I healed because they had surgery, everything like that. Foster felt absolutely in love with her. Um, the foster coordinator at that time did not do, um, we have to do background checks, and in Ohio they have to have a $100,000 liability on their house to be able to have a pit bull. Um, our foster coordinator didn't check into that. So she came back after having this animal for two months and said, oh, by the way, I want to adopt her. We actually love her. And we had to say, I'm sorry, you can't, you don't fit the requirements of owning a pit bull. So you cared for this animal for two months, fell in love, and then, I'm sorry, you can't have her now. Thanks for healing her, though, and thank you for your home for two months. Obviously, that foster did not come back. Not a good experience. Um, so, yes, anything that you expect from your doctors, expect from your fosters. It's that, I mean, it's that simple. Um, they're animals are living in their house for a long period of time and you want to make sure they're going to be they're meeting your adoption requirements so uh, one thing too fosters that now uh, they do get the first chance of adoption um, if they fell in love with this dog it's not coming back into the shelter which is awesome we actually have that a lot now um, that's freeing up the cage in our shelter and that's not putting stress on the animal to be in a foster home and then have to come back and sit in a shelter for four weeks before it gets adopted. It's coming in, going to foster, and then it's not leaving, um, which is awesome. Or, I mean, we always encourage uh, fosters to bring their friends over. I mean, they're the best people to talk about this animal and promote this animal. They know it. Um, and we get a lot of people who their friends are adopting these animals now because they're promoting these animals. They know them best. Um, so it's really nice because you have more space to take more dogs and you're getting more home. So um, definitely, I guess the biggest key is be organized. Know what's in foster. Know who has your foster dogs. Know how long they're supposed to be in foster. Um, ours is a little bit different because we don't we don't foster dogs when they're adoptable. Most of our adoptable dogs are in our shelter except for pit bulls. Um, we're, with the law in Ohio, we're only allowed to have two um, at our shelter up for adoption. Uh, so we have them up for adoption, but in our foster homes. Most of them, though, they're coming back after eight weeks when they're old enough to come up for adoption or after that two months when they're um, healed. No when they're coming back, so you can say, I need to save space for this dog. He's coming back. Because nothing frustrates the foster more, I think, than saying absolutely you're, you're um, done fostering this dog on such and such a date, and then two months later they still have that dog. That's something that really frustrates them. So know what's in your foster program, when they're coming back, um, why they are in foster, are they too young, are they sick, do they have food aggression that needs modified, um, know what they're in foster for. Uh, we have in our clinic area a giant board and it has every single person's name, um, the animals that they're fostering, why they're being fostered, the date they went out, the date they're supposed to come back. Um, that way we have no question as to, sorry, I don't have the space anymore. Can you hold on to it for another two weeks? Um, we know when they're coming back. So definitely being organized is the best thing I can tell you. And we do a foster care agreement per animal. And they have, they have been using Margo for a year. She only fosters pit bulls, but every time I take her into a pit bull, she signs a new foster care agreement because that agreement is specific to that animal. And we also learned the hard way where we had to get police involved and actually file a civil lawsuit to get a litter of kittens back from a foster. Uh, none of that. Um, <laughs> I don't know how to turn that off. So um, from then on, we learned that you have a very specific agreement. Now, we still got our kittens back, but it was a much longer process than if I had had in agreement that had those three kittens with that person at that address and it would have just made things easier. So we do that now and our fosters don't seem to mind, it protects them as well. 
um, then I can't go, well, I gave you that dog, where'd it go? And like, you never gave me the dog, I never had the dog, you know. So that way you just, you both feel comfortable and it doesn't take but one page, one side, just a minute. Have, a, have your lawyer, and if you don't have a lawyer for you to rescue um, or for your shelter, recruit one. Or at least have an advisory board who understands the legal issues in the animal welfare industry that you can bounce stuff off of, have them review your contracts and liability agreements and waivers and things to make sure you're not missing any language. Um, you can usually get volunteers to do that. You don't even have to shell out money. We've had to send our cool shelters out too. To, we just started doing that too. Uh, we've had to send cool shelters out to go and confiscate our own animals back because people don't want to bring them back. Um, so definitely getting it in writing that they are yours, and when they are to, due to come back, then you get them back. Any questions? Again, we'll be at the, um, the expert roundtables at 3.30, so please join us. Um, we have, um, this is Tiger if you need them. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, do you have a specific way to deal with fosters who do not make their animals available at your adopted days? Um, we tend to keep them at home and let you support that animal uh, yeah. long term. Yeah, we um, we have a, I have a volunteer who's a transport coordinator. That is her job is to arrange transportation for animals to get from point A to point B, whether it's the vet, whether it is to an event whether it is whatever. So if the foster says, I cannot drive, and the gas is too high, I don't have time, I'll say, no problem. Jim or whoever is going to come out, and if you're going to go, make sure somebody's home right between 10, 30, and 11, he'll pick up the animal and bring it to the event, and then bring it back afterwards. So um, I give them the opportunity to participate, and that is part of our um, our application and our agreement, is that you will make an effort to bring the animal to the event when, when asked of you. And then when you, if they refuse, you do terminate the foster? Yeah, we try to talk to them. We try to be, sometimes they're scared. They just can't let go. They're a little too attached and they can't keep it themselves. I understand that. I don't. I want to help them and I don't want to lose the foster, especially if they're a good one. So we'll try to work with them first and see if we can help ease the, the scary fears. We'll bring them in on the, on the process. So I'll tell them, listen, if I get an applicant, you're more than welcome to meet them and talk to them or go with you to do the home check and then they feel a little bit more involved. It's not so scary to let go. Um, so I, I try to work with them as best as possible. I do kind of have a pattern rule, like if this is becoming a bad habit pattern over time, then that will take stronger measures. Okay. Yes? Do you have copies of any of these agreements? Or yeah, well, we can make them available. I didn't want to kill a forest, so um, we're going to put them up on the website. You can download them, and if you don't have the ability to do that, give me your card, and I'd be happy to email it or mail it to you. And then it's Pause for Life? Yeah, Pause for Life, and Jody's going to make some other stuff available, too, from you know, from the shelter side and from the rest I'll put our rescue application and our rescue contract on there, um, and also our foster application. 